Hey everybody, welcome back to another one of these videos about sequencing with signals in Max. So this is our fundamentals series where basically we're going through a different object that's used in sequencing in Max each episode. So this time we're talking about the what object, which you've seen in a lot of the prior videos, but today we're going to take a deep dive into it. So let's get into it. So I'm going to start the deck here and just show you really quickly what this object does. And you've probably already seen this before. Basically what we have happening here is a phaser, which is producing a ramp. And the what object in its default state, it's just going to produce an impulse each time the phaser signal crosses zero. So what we can see is here, we're actually, we have two scopes layered on top of one another. Actually, there's three, but really two. The white one is the phaser. And then the orange one is the what object. So you can see we're getting this orange line that lines up pretty much perfectly with the wrap of the phaser. And when I say the wrap, I mean that point where the phaser drops from one down to zero. And we're seeing that same thing down here. Every time we cross zero, we get an impulse. Now, it doesn't only have to be zero. So I can send a floating point number in, like 0 0.3. And you can now see that we're getting that impulse at that point along the phaser's ramp. So that's what the subject does. Most of the time when we're using it, um, we're using it in that default mode where it's looking for zero. And the reason is because very often we sort of correlate events to the ends of these ramp cycles. So if we were using a subdiv object, which we looked at in one of the past videos, and we stick that in the middle here, and let's set this back to zero. And then uh, this scope will connect to the subdiv. You can see we're getting those lines at the end of each of those ramps. So it's a very easy way, basically, simply, to turn ramps into impulses. One thing that we can do with those uh, impulses is something like a sample and hold. So very often, if you're working with randomness or any kind of unpredictable signal or really any kind of signal, and you want to be able to sort of have a quantized feed of it, right? Say you have a sequencer and every time an event happens, a node event happens, you want to get a new value. That's an, an application of a sample and hold, which in the last video on stash, we actually saw an example of that. And the way that I can achieve this sample and hold is in this case, I'm just taking a noise object, which is just giving me white noise all over the frequency spectrum. So a bunch of random values between negative one and one. I pass that into the left inlet of this saw object, a sample and hold. And then what's impulses into the right outlet tells that saw object when to sample. So we get this kind of stepped signal. And if you watch that stash video, you saw we kind of worked with this type of stuff a good deal. Obviously, you also noted, saw that we used um, the what object with, with stash. So I can send that into the third inlet of the object. And if I create a multi slider, and I pass a list in, then those impulses in this default mode of stash tell it to output a new value. So these impulses are pretty variously useful, and we'll talk about some of the other applications of them in this video and also in future videos. In addition to being able to pass a single value, like we have here, into the stash object, you can also pass lists. So in this example, which is a little bit more complicated because we actually have a sound going on here, which I'll, um, I'll turn up the gain on in a second. But before we do that, we have here, actually, this is just a multi-slider as well, this orange thing. But I have it uh, shifted and rotated 90 degrees so that it's horizontal. And you can see that we are getting impulses that correlate to each of these four positions at 0 0.26, 0 0.56, 0 0.79, and 0 0.91. So this is a really cool way to generate uh, 
impulses along some time spectrum that's being generated by the, uh, by the phaser object that are completely unquantized. So if we bring up the gain here, oops, sorry. I'm gonna bring down the uh, hold here. You see that we can have really any, let's raise the pitch. Any kind of pattern that we wanna have. In this particular example, what I'm actually doing is taking the values from the multi-slider and sorting them so that if I do something like this, it'll actually rearrange them. Just a little bit easier to make sense of as we, you know, pass each of those points, we can work our way down and see those events actually occurring. But you could, of course, just connect a regular multi-slider like we had, or was it? I guess I deleted it, but multi-slider. Uh, with a range of zero to one. Any normally multi-slider or any normal list will do. So now we're producing eight events because we're actually using this one. Let's go back to this. So that's a list. And that's, I mean, probably one of the most exciting and kind of easy to do things is make really weird patterns that are completely unquantized in this fashion. And you can grab, if you want to, this little set of utility objects, which is basically just a, um, I think this is also a multi-slider. This is just a regular slider, all kind of layered on top of each other so that you can visualize what's happening, right? We have this red line that's representing the motion of the phaser. And we have the white line that's basically in, uh, representing which of the what object's steps we are on. Because the wet object will actually output from its second outlet uh, an integer, which is the step that it's currently on. So in addition to those impulses that we get uh, from the left outlet, we also get an integer. It's a lot like the rightmost outlet of the subdiv object, and that can be useful for driving things like UI um, visualizations of what we're doing. So in addition to the, um, the ability to kind of look, when, when we look for a value, um, it's, that algorithm is, uh, is based on some trigger mode. So this trigger mode is an attribute and has four options, ascending, descending, ascending or descending, and equals. And it basically says, when I'm looking for that value, what has to be happening uh, to the slope, basically, of the line? Um, in the default mode, it's expecting to have a rising signal. So it's really expecting to have something like a phaser ramp. So here we have an example where we're using it, what at 0 0.5. So we're getting that impulse halfway along. If I make this phaser go in reverse, so go downwards, you see that we don't get that impulse. If I make the phaser go in kind of a triangle pattern, you see we only get it on the rise. So if you had a different type of signal, let's say a descending signal, and you wanted that event, that, you know, that threshold to be recognized, you would have to change the trigger mode of the what object. If it was somewhat unpredictable, we might do something like this. And then there's equals, which you'll notice we're not getting it firing on any of these ramp signals. And the reason is the object is smart. When we have a ramp like this, we might not get an exact value of 0 0.5, right? Because this ramp from 0 to 1 is being quantized at 44,100 hertz. Samples a second. And we might not get exactly 0 0.5. So you typically don't want to use this equals when you have a, um, a signal that's changing and that wouldn't be exactly the value that you're looking for. I can kind of force it to do that by stair-stepping it. So what I'm doing here is um, some kind of subdivision. I, 
I'd have to check. Yeah, subdiv. So we're using a subdiv to make sure that you know eight steps in, the value is exactly zero point five, and so you can see we get this gate at that point. So this might be something that you could do if you wanted to produce gates. Like we could send in a list that said zero point two, zero point. Uh, let's actually change this to ten though, so that's a little bit easier. So I'm going to make the subdiv ten, and I'm going to divide the second outlet, which is the um, the uh, the current step as a whole number signal. So now if I send 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and pass that list into the what object, you can see we get gates at those points. And there's other ways to create gates from impulses, which we'll actually talk about in the next video. But if, you know, this could be one way um, that you could do that. I find that almost always I'm using ascending because I'm almost always using signals that look like this. But if you're using something that's a little bit different, you can use that trigger mode attribute. One thing, though, that does not work, and we've discovered this in some of the other videos, is if you look at these two examples here on the right. So I have a sub, I have two subdiv 16s, but on one of them, I'm using this prob attribute. And if you're not sure what's going on here, watch the subdiv video, I'll put the link up above. But basically we're using the prob attribute to skip every other step. So we have a ramp, then a flat section, then a ramp, then a flat section. Whereas here on the left, we just have ramp, 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 ramp. But you can see that the result that we get is exactly the same for both of these. Even though our trigger mode, actually I guess our trigger mode is ascending or descending, but if we change it to ascending, it doesn't fix the problem. Oh, I suppose it does with descending. Like, this may have actually been a recent fix because I remember that at some point we were having trouble getting this to work in one of the videos. So there's a hack for that. If you're running into this problem where you're, you know, you're doing something like using prob or you're just generating ramps that aren't always preceded by another ramp, it looks like using descending works. Another uh, solution is to just not use the what tilde object before and use this little bit of patching which basically is just going to look for the start of a ramp and only ever fire an impulse when a ramp starts. And this little abstraction that I have here, which we'll include um, in the package in GitHub, along with this patch, you could use that as well. So a few solutions for handling this problem of um, in the default state, the object loves to give us more pulses than we really expect to get. And my final example for you is FLAM, which let me just pull the Wikipedia up. It consists of two single st strokes played by alternating hands, or in our case, alternating what tilde objects. The first stroke is a quieter grace note, followed by a louder primary stroke on the opposite hand. The two notes are played almost simultaneously and are intended to sound like a single broader note. Um, so as I understand it, this primary stroke is happening kind of on a downbeat or some even subdivision, and then the grace note is is early. Uh, so the way that I've set this up in Max is the primary strokes are generated on the right side here. Uh, we have a subdiv eight. In fact, we have two of those uh, focusing on the left hand side. So this is the primary stroke where we just have a subdiv going into a what object, which is then going into this envelope uh, sub patch that's generating a little um, you know simple ahr. Envelope, and we'll talk actually in a future video with the one uh, where we do ramp. Uh, we'll talk about how to make this. And um, then on the right side, we have our flam. And we're using this little matrix control with a prob construction that we used in the subdiv video. So if you are confused by this, go watch that video to basically decide which of the steps, which of those eight steps uh, we, we do the flam on. And then this floating point number basically specifies uh, where in time we we perform that flam, like how far from the up from the next note do we do it, where uh, one is exactly the same time as the primary stroke. So as we move downwards from one, we're moving that grace stroke 
further away from the primary stroke. So if I just start things here, and I bring the gain up, you can hear we're getting that little event. And as I move this down, I'm increasing the amount of time in between that grace note and the primary stroke. And what we're visualizing over here on the right side is the grace notes ramp and then the impulse that fires to actually trigger the envelope and actually trigger that note event to occur. So you can get some pretty cool stuff here. In fact, if we were to maybe use a noise and maybe we'll scale this between, I don't know, zero point, I don't know, let's see, as uh, well, zero to one, and then we'll scale that to, or sorry, negative one to one. And we'll scale that between, I don't know, 0 0.65 and 0 point, I don't know, nine, eight. And then we'll sample any time we get uh, an impulse. And then we need to put it through a snapshot. In fact, we don't need to do this saw part, we'll just do this. So we're going to take this what, we're going to turn it into a, um, a bang by passing it through an edge tilde object, which is going to give us a floating point number, and then we'll pass that in. So now we're actually randomizing that flam distance from the uh, from the primary stroke, and you could do this lots of other ways, right? You could use a, a stash object to kind of sequence that uh, that interval or whatever you want to do. So let's talk about this velocity patch really quickly. So what we're using in here is a sample and hold again, where we have on into the left inlet, we have the primary strokes impulses coming through. And on the right inlet, we have the grace notes impulses coming through. And all we're doing is basically we're taking an impulse and we're just sampling that impulse using a, a sample and hold. So this is kind of an effective way to like turn an impulse at some value into just a constant signal at that value. So if we get a one in here, let me just create a, a, a scope. And I restart the deck and I'll turn the gain down. And actually let me change the range here so you can actually see things. 0 0.1, negative 0, 0.1 to 1.1. You can see like we're mostly getting one because every time we get an impulse from the primary, it's just sampling one and giving us a solid value of one. But then each time that we receive an impulse, a grace note impulse, it multi that impulse is then multiplied by 0 0.5, and that is sampled, so we get a short period of the output, which is at 0 0.5. And then down here, this ramp smooth object, all that's doing is just kind of smoothing the output a little bit. It's kind of hard to see on the scope, but these lines are basically less straight. And what that does is help to kind of prevent some clicks uh, that might be audible on the output uh, when we actually play this back. So let's hear that one more time. And actually I can show you what happens if we take the ramp smooth out. So you can hear a tiny little click there because that amplitude is actually changing really rapidly. So we just smooth that out and that goes away. Cool. That's it for today. Uh, stay tuned for the next one. We're going to talk about the ramp object, which is really, really useful for particularly for generating envelopes. Uh, at a high level, what it does is basically go turn from impulses back into ramps or back into kind of slope, slopey, phasery type of uh, signals. Um, if you're enjoying these, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Uh, just going to keep coming with these videos, these fundamentals videos, and there's also some other cool stuff in the pipeline as well, um, just some other kind of tutorials. Uh, and as always, use the comments down below to let me know how you're feeling about these, any things, any ideas that you have, any uh, thing that you want to learn, anything that's confusing. It's always helpful to get that feedback. So thanks. Enjoy these, and I'll see you next time.